In this video, we're going to discuss the Born interpretation of the wave function. Now, in the previous videos, we've been talking about the wave function as a piece of Schrodinger's wave equation, right? H psi equals E psi. And that psi is the wave function, right? So you would set up a Hamiltonian for a system. You would get some solutions in the form of these wave functions, and they would tell you something about the system. In fact, uh, they're a central pillar of quantum mechanics. So I've written up here the central uh, principle of quantum mechanics is that the wave function contains all of the dynamical information about the system that it is describing, right? The Hamiltonian contains operators that are related to the energy of the system. And then the wave function contains all the dynamical information, right? Including, and I think most principally, the particle's location. And that's what we're going to focus on here with the Born interpretation is how do we figure out from a wave function where a particle is located in space, right? So in order to do that, we use the Born inter interpretation, which this was uh, developed by Max Born in the early 1900s. And he made an analogy to classical wave theory in order to figure out this way to interpret wave functions, right? So the analogy that he made, so he made an analogy to classical waves, right? And what he did here is in classical wave theory, in order to figure out the intensity of a wave, right? I'll use a capital I to denote intensity. That intensity is proportional to the square of the amplitude of that wave, right? So, um, so if you have a wave, right, I'll just draw a little waveform here, right? This peak right here, this is the amplitude, right? So if you wanna know the intensity of a wave, you take the square of the amplitude. So interpreting these wave functions as waves in quantum mechanics, he basically built up a way to figure out the probability of the location of a particle based on this analogy. So if we're thinking about quantum mechanics, right, we can use the square of the wave function in a very similar way. Right, so if we wanna figure out the probability of the location of a particle, that's going to be equal to the square of the wave function. Right, and in, in one dimension, we would have the volume element dx, right? So integrating over this probability distribution would give you the pr uh, probability of a particle being in a particular region of space. So let's see what that would look like in a graph. So I've drawn this plot here. The x-axis is basically um, the location, right, x. And what I've drawn out here is the square of the wave function. This will be a probability distribution. Right, so plotted here in green is the square of the wave function. And let's say that we wanted to figure out the probability of the particle being located in this region of space, dx. What we would have to do is denote the points in space, x and x plus dx. That would give us a region of space to look at. Then we would have to integrate over that region in order to figure out the probability, right? If we integrate over this region of space, that gives us the probability of the um, of the particle being in that region of space. Now, we have to be very careful when we talk about these things, right? We can't say the particle is located at X. We have to say, you know, it has a 75 percent probability of being located at X. Right. It's just the nature of Schrodinger's equation that there's a certain level of, you know, stochastic randomness associated with this. There's a certain level of, you know, probabilistic nature of the equation. Now, we also have to be very careful with wave functions because wave functions can be complex. Um, they can be complex functions, complex numbers. So when we say we're taking the square of the wave function, if we're being really precise, we're really taking the square modulus of the wave function. What that means is that you're gonna take the wave function and you're gonna take the modulus of the wave function times itself again, right? dx. So this is, you know, kind of review your either linear algebra or just your complex numbers from uh, traditional algebra. It's the same thing, right? So if you have a complex function, you have to take the modulus of it, right? So this is technically known as the square modulus. 
So square modulus. And when we go through a few examples, you'll see how it's done. But, you know, feel free if you don't remember how to do this, look back at some math, um, figure out how to take the modulus of a function, modulus of a complex number. If the if the function is real, if the number is real, then you can just take the square just as you normally would. But we have to be very careful because wave functions can be uh, complex. They can include imaginary numbers. Right. So you would you would look at the wave function, you would square it. You get this probability density. You figure out which region of space you're interested in. And then you integrate over that region of space to figure out the probability. Now, this can be extended to three dimensions. So if we're looking at this in 3D. Right. If we're looking for the probability, then that would just be the square of the wave function. Obviously, this wave function would now be a three dimensional function, right? So we will have a volume element that instead of just DX, we will have DX, DY, DZ. Now, um, in, in this course, I use the notation uh, for just a general volume element because you can have DX, DY, DZ, you can have DR, D theta, D phi, you can have different coordinates. So when I'm speaking very generally, um, I'll use the Greek letter tau to denote all coordinates, right? So what I'll do is instead of saying dx, dy, dz, I'll just say d tau. And tau just is a, a shortcut to mean all coordinates. Right? So whatever you got, dx, dy, dz, dr, d theta, d phi, whatever your, your coordinates are, we're looking at all the coordinates when I say d tau. So whenever I'm introducing something just very generally, I may use this notation of d tau instead of using the specific Cartesian or spherical coordinates. So just be on the lookout for that. Um, now, what this means, um, you know, trying to visualize this like we did in one dimension, what would this mean in three dimensions? Well, what we'll be doing is taking a certain region of space, right? Just like we did here. Um, we're taking a three dimensional region of space, chunk of space, um, and trying to figure out the particle's probability of being in that region of space. Now, right now, since we're talking very generally and it, it, this probabilistic talk might not seem very useful, but you'll see that it ends up being very powerful uh, when we're trying to figure out things in quantum mechanics. You can use this, uh, this these probabilities of locations in order to figure out some very difficult and hard problems. OK, so uh, within the Born uh, approximate or the Born interpretation, uh, wave functions have to have certain properties in order to be valid, acceptable wave functions. Right. So um, I'm actually going to erase this plot here so that I can uh, draw these out or write these down. Right. So you have to there are four criteria that I want to highlight four properties that wave functions have to have in order to be valid. Right. So four properties. Wave functions must have. Right. And this is specifically what they must have in order to be valid within the Born interpretation. So what you'll figure out is sometimes there's, you know, solutions that would work as solutions to Schrodinger's equation. But those solutions may not give you a valid interpretation with the Born interpretation. So you you really want to make sure they have these four properties. So the first one is that they are square integrable. So square integrable. And all that means is that you can integrate the square of that function. That should be obvious here because we're going to have to integrate over the square of the function in order to figure out the probability here. Right. So it has to be square integrable. Also, um, this leads to a property called normalization. A wave function has to be normalized in order for it to be interpreted in this fashion. That's something that we'll talk about in a future lecture in this unit. Um, but just be on the lookout for that. And one of those properties that a function must have is that it must be square integrable um, in order to fit with the Born interpretation. The second is that it is single valued. Right. The function must be single valued. Right. So the reason that is, is because you can't have two probabilities of in the same region of space. Right. If I if I put a region, if I specify a region of space 
And I, I say that it has a 40% probability of being located in that region of space. It can't also have a 50% probability of being located in that region of space, right? That's not how probabilities work. So the function has to be single valued, right? You think about, a, you know, heads or tails, right? You can't say, you know, a coin, a coin if you flip it, it has a 50% chance of being tails and also has a 20% chance of being tails, right? Doesn't make sense. If we're speaking with in, in probabilities, these functions have to have single values, right? They have to be single valued functions. Um, the third property that it must have is it must be continuous at all points in space. So continuous at all points in space, right? So any defined uh, points where the potential is continuous, this function must also be a continuous function, right? Um, so no jump discontinuities, stuff like that. It has to be a continuous function at all space. Um, and the fourth one is that the first derivative must be continuous. So the first derivative must also be continuous at any point where the potential is continuous as well, right? So we got first derivative must be continuous. Okay, so these four properties, square integrable, single valued, continuous at all points in space, and the first derivative must also be continuous. These four properties, if a wave function meets these four properties, it's an acceptable wave function within the Born interpretation. So let's look at a few example plots and see if we can figure out um, if they meet the Born interpretation or not. And if so, if not, what's wrong with them, right? So let's look at A. So A, this is the um, function that I've plotted here for A. And let's see if we can figure out if it's a, a valid function for a valid wave function within the Born interpretation. So the answer is it's not going to be a valid function, but what is the reason? Well, the reason is that it's not continuous, right? This function has this huge jump discontinuity located at this point. So it's gonna be an invalid wave function or an invalid wave function within the Born interpretation. So the answer here is no, because it is not continuous. Okay, so let's look at B. So B is this function, it comes to a little cusp here and then goes back up. So it's decreasing, comes to a cusp and starts to increase again. So if you remember from your early calculus work, um, any function like this that goes to this uh, cusp, that's gonna have a, a non-continuous first derivative, right? So if you you know look here, this derivative at this point, the slope at that point is gonna be a straight line. So it doesn't have a continuous derivative. So this is going to also not be an acceptable wave function because the first derivative is not continuous. So first derivative, not continuous. Okay, so moving on to C, C is a function that has like an S shape. So it starts to increase gradually, snakes around, and comes back to a kind of a flat point here, right? So why would this one, this is also not going to be a valid wave function, right? Um, so why would it not be valid? Well, um, this is not gonna be single valued, right? If I go to this point X here, right? So let's call this X prime is the point that I'm looking at. You can see that I cut through three different points for that wave function. So if I were to integrate over a probability distribution, right, even though it's a continuous function and I can integrate it, uh, judging from a standpoint of probability, it would not be single valued. So you would end up with multiple different probabilities for the same region of space. Can't have that when interpreting these wave functions within the Born interpretation. So no, not single valued. Okay, moving on to the last one, right? So in this last one, we get a, a sharp increase in the wave function. It goes all the way up to infinity, and then it comes back down from infinity and drops back down um, into the region of space here. Um, so this is also not going to be acceptable um, as a wave function because uh, one of the other features here is that in order for it to be continuous, it has to be finite within the region of space defined, right? So this one is obviously not finite 
within the region of space. So it's not going to be acceptable. So no, not finite. Right. So now a wave function can technically be infinite. We'll talk more about potentials uh, later. If the potential is infinite, then the wave function can be um, infinite as well. But anywhere where the potential is continuous, the wave function also has to be continuous. So um, so for this case, since it's not finite within a region where the potential is continuous, this is not going to be an acceptable wave function. OK, so these were four examples of wave functions that would not fit with the Born interpretation, right? So this whole video has just been an overview of that Born interpretation, uh, what it means and how we would actually apply it.